they're just, I'd wanted to list a couple different cover types here. So you can kind of have an idea of why deer might be using certain areas, uh, you know, throughout the day. So there's four different cover types. Essentially there's thermal cover. They use that to keep warm. So when it's really cold, some of those really dense um, grass, you know, native grass fields, again, provide great thermal cover to block the wind. Um, another example of this would be cedar thickets. Um, escape cover. So where can they go to keep safe? Um, if something is chasing them, where can they go to either not be seen or it be something that they know that that, that threat cannot get through? Um, fawning cover during the summertime, um, again, to keep safe. And then travel cover. So um, using cover as a, a shield or a corridor to move from point A to point B. So we'll talk a little bit about physiology here. Um, that simply means how a body part functions. So deer have got a lot of purpose built parts that help them stay alive and communicate with other deer. Um, the most important tool they have to stay alive is their nose. Um, you know, it's 500 to 1,000 times stronger than, than the nose we have. Um, it's got 297 million olfactory receptors, which are the cells that essentially send a scent to the brain. Uh, just for a comparison, dogs uh, have 220 million. So, you know, it's, it's quite a bit better than what a dog's nose is. So taking that into consideration, you always want deer to approach you from upwind of your location. So take that into account when you are picking up a spot and uh, how you approach that, that hunting area. So an example here, if I know that I want to sit here where this gray spot is, and I know that uh, from scouting, there's quite a bit of deer bedding back in this area. If there is a north wind, so coming from the north, I would want to take either this yellow or blue route because the wind is keeping my scent out of their nose. Whereas if it's a, a west wind or a south wind, I would want to walk this way, if that makes sense. Just talking a little bit about eyesight, um, again, just some quick bullet points. Um, they have, this is all comparing to, to what we see. Um, so deer have more rods, which is good for nighttime vision, and they have less cones, which lead to worse daytime and, and color um, vision than we have. Um, a lot of people think that deer are colorblind, uh, you know, that they can't see any color at all. Um, it really only applies to that red and green scale. So they're red, green, colorblind. So if you're wearing colors, you want to stay away from things like blue. Um, very wild, wide field of view. It's about 270 degrees. So, um, just because that deer isn't looking right at you does not mean that he can't see you. Um, so with all of that being considered, the color of your clothing is really not that important as long as it breaks up that human outline. And, uh, the biggest thing would be movement there. So sit still and, uh, you'll have a lot better experience. Talking about hearing, um, they hear higher frequency sounds better than we do and low frequency sounds worse than we do. So an uh, example of a higher frequency sound would be like when your, uh, when your jacket sleeve rubs against, you know, uh, another piece of material or fabric, um, that would be an example of a high frequency sound. Uh, and they can also move their ears independently. So move them separately from each other and they can use that feature to triangulate a direction of sound. So they can, you'll see deer turning their ears different ways to find out exactly where a sound is coming from, which can pinpoint you as a threat. And then deer, as far as, uh, as communication with other deer, they've got tons of scent glands. Um, we're not going to go over every single one of them, but here's just a, a quick graphic on, on where some of those glands are. And they use those uh, in rubs and scrapes. So this is behavior that bucks do um, for a couple different reasons. Um, you can see a buck down here in the bottom left corner making a scrape. Um, he is using that interdigital gland to mark that area. And they will also urinate in that scrape um, to kind of mark their territory, so to speak, and let uh, other deer know that he is in the area. 
And then above that scrape will be a branch that hangs over it. And it'll usually be void of all leaves. So it'll be kind of easy to see it. And they'll lick that, that branch and they'll rub their orbital glands. So up around their eyes and on top of their forehead as well on those branches. Again, scent marking some of that stuff. And then the top right is a rub. And this is actually caused from their antlers. So they will rub their antlers up and down a tree. Um, which disperses some of the scent off of those forehead glands. Um, again, just kind of territory marking, letting other bucks and does know that he's in the area. Another time you'll see rubs are actually early in the summer, or late in the summer, excuse me, early in the fall, where bucks are rubbing velvet off of their antlers. So, you know, it's been kind of a crash course here on all this, and you've got to take into, into consideration that all of these things are playing a role on movement and behavior at the same time. So the time of year, the weather, what food sources are available, water availability, all of those things are all kind of playing into to one big complicated web and it can be a little overwhelming. Um, but just as long as you kind of remember some of the baseline things that we talked about. So always, always pay attention to that wind direction um, because their nose is their most useful tool. Um, and just make sure that you guys uh, get set up in a spot that's comfy and uh, be sure to stay still because again, we talked about how good their eyes can be um, and that will lead to, to a more successful day of field. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Did that work okay? Yeah, it sure did. Yeah, it sure did. All right. Well, thank you guys. I don't know if Casey, you just want to hop right into the next one or if we're going to do questions after each one or what, what you had said, but yeah. we'll just cruise right along. Yeah. We'll just uh, hop right into the next we'll just, one. Uh, and thank you again, Dallas. That was Dallas Barber, the big game biologist for the Department of Wildlife Conservation. And now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, his name is Bruce Haddock, and he is um, the owner of Now or Never Outfitters, and it's a 501-3C nonprofit that takes wounded warriors and veterans hunting and fishing for free. Their motto is serving those who have served all, and their goal is to afford these men and women an opportunity to do something that they don't have the opportunity to do or can't afford today. They believe that healing comes from being outdoors. And Bruce is going to talk about shot placement and um, rifle, different rifles that would be a good starter rifles out for you guys. Hi, can everybody hear me? Probably a thumbs up yep. from everybody. There we go. Again, I'm Bruce Haddock. Uh, I have a partner that helps me with Now and Never. Uh, his name is Austin Dietrich. He runs everything in Oklahoma for us, the hunt and lodge, the hunts and all that. And so uh, if you want to look us up, you can look us up at Now and Never Outfitters on social media, um, Instagram, Facebook, or even on our website. Uh, get in touch with us and We'd be more than happy to try to set something up with you. So uh, but I'm going to talk about shot placement. There's a few things we want to cover before we get to that point because there's a lot of critical things. Um, some of the things that we've learned, uh, last year was our first year to actually take a wounded warrior and two of his sons on the youth hunt, which went incredibly well. Uh, but one of the things we realized is dad was bringing his rifles instead of rifles for the that were applicable to the to the youth. And so... Um, some of the good rifles that a, a young person can shoot that would be comfortable doesn't have a whole lot of kick or recoil would be like a 2430 or a 6.5. Uh, now my 13-year-old, he shoots a 270 and does fine. It's just all about how familiar are you with shooting, how's the rifle set up and things of that nature. Um, one of the critical things with a rifle is you always want to verify the ammo you have. I know that my wife hunts with one uh, caliper rifle. I hunt with another. My son hunts with a 270. And so a lot of times those calibers and those shells can look really, really similar. They can be real similar in necking uh, and diameter and casing and height. And so you want to verify that. Just read the bottom of the casing to make sure that you have the right ammo. Uh, last thing you want to do is get out to the tree stand, get out to your hunting spot, and realize that you've done grabbed the wrong ammo and now your hunt's a bust. Uh, and I know that would be really disappointing for a first-time hunter, a young, a young person going out for the first time and um, – just not being able to shoot anything because daddy brought the wrong ammo, right? So uh, another critical thing with the rifle is sighting it in. I know that everybody shoots a little bit different. And so uh, my, uh, my kid might shoot a little different than me, might pull a little different. So it's really critical that you allow uh, the young people to shoot the rifle if they have the time. 
But uh, don't just don't just put them into a position where they're where they're hunting blind. And this goes for adults too. I know a lot of people want to borrow other people's rifles. Uh, I'm uh, in Texas right now, and we're doing uh, setting up some hunts and stuff here with different people, uh, helping them, and uh, not on now or never's point, but just on other people that are hunting and trying to help them guys get out in the field. But they're like, well, I'll just borrow somebody's rifle. And it's like, well, if you're not familiar with that, it, it could really be a big difference. Um, so always sight in your rifle. And the other good thing for that is if you allow the kid to, or the young person to shoot the rifle, they're not scared of the gun, okay? That gives them a little familiarity with shooting the gun. They can get comfortable with it. It's the same thing that goes for adults. When we shoot rifles, the more we shoot them, uh, we shoot our bows, the more we shoot our bows, the more we get comfortable with muscle memory, and, and it just helps us to make better shot plays for it. Uh, one of the things we talked about the other night that we think is really important is uh, shooting sticks. Some form of stability for a younger hunter, a more inexperienced hunter. Uh, you can literally take two one bys, uh, three foot tall, four foot tall, run a nail in them, bend it over. I know my dad did that back in the day. And instead of buying something that's $100 from Academy, Bass Pro, Cabela's, uh, if you've got the money to spend, great, do that. It's a quality product. I know that my, my sons have theirs. My wife even has one. I carry one sometimes with me. Um, I have bipods on some of my rifles, which make a big difference too. But you want a stable platform to shoot from. Uh, last thing you want to try to do is have a kid miss a shot, a young person miss a shot, because they weren't real strong or couldn't stabilize their shot. Uh, and so the last thing we're going to talk about is shot placement. Shot placement is really critical. Uh, Casey's going to show uh, share a picture that um, – to help understand shot placement. But right behind the shoulder, a couple inches just behind the shoulder there, if you see where the green dot is on the screen, uh, if y'all can see that, kind of give me a thumbs up. I only see you, Casey. I don't see anybody else on here. I think everybody's cameras might be muted. But um, right there it says aim here. That's a critical, that's a perfect area for shot placement. You have your heart, uh, your lungs, your liver in that area. That's your, what your vital organs, your kill, your kill zone is. Uh, if you get a little too far back, you're going to gut shoot them. And we're shooting a deer in the gut. They're most likely going to run off. They'll suffer. And so with shot placement, the last thing we want to do is uh, rush a shot. If we don't have a good shot on a deer, maybe there's a lot of thick brush or something like Dallas was talking about earlier. They're moving through. We want to make sure we have a clear line of sight. And, and I would also say this, even later in the evening, um, I know a lot of times we want to get that shot off. We want to get that deer into the season. We might not have got a bag limit that we wanted. So we try to rush something. But if the daylight is not there, sometimes that can throw you off too. There's things that you won't be able to see. You might have a twig in the way. You shoot. It'll deflect your shot. Uh, and, again, the last thing we want to do as outdoorsmen, as hunters, is enter, uh, injure an animal to where they're going to have to go off and suffer or we're going to have to spend hours tracking this, this animal, which is no fun. In the thick grass, I know up in northwest Oklahoma where we're used to hunting at, in the thick areas, it just it wears on you. So uh, that's pretty much all I've got to say about shot placement. I hope it's been beneficial to you. So. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, sure appreciate that. Okay, so next speaker is going to be Bobby Armstrong. And like I said, he is the Save the Hunt coordinator for NWTF. And him and I work very closely together. And he's going to talk about um, how to be a good mentor and um, gear necessities. So, Bobby, take it away. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. All right, good. So let's talk about some some equipment that you might want to have. Um, if you spend any time in Cabela's Pro Academy or uh, just a local shop in your town, uh, there is all kinds of stuff that you can buy to go hunting with. Um, and a lot of us, including myself, uh, you know, I have bought a lot of this stuff thinking it was going to be the uh, next best thing and make me the great white hunter. And some of it has worked. Some of it has not worked. But um, if you're brand new to hunting, you don't have to start out that way. Uh, so I've kind of broke up some things of, of that you, you have to have in order to go hunting. And then some things that would be nice to have if you were choice and uh, a legal weapon of your choice and make sure ammo, like Bruce said, um, 
So you have Amber on that. Uh, I also carry toilet paper with me. Uh, other beside the the uh, obvious reason to carry toilet paper, uh, I use toilet paper for when I'm tracking a deer to help mark my trail. Um, so I can kind of see which way that deer is going as I'm looking for blood and um, following it. Um, I carry a flashlight or a headlamp, either one. Uh, you know, they, they make small flashlights. They even make flashlights that mount in a cap. Um, you know, but you, you need some type of headlamp for going out early in the morning or uh, coming in late at night. You know, after um, you uh, get through hunting, like Dallas said, the deer right now uh, are moving first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Um, the next thing is appropriate clothing. Uh, you know, Dallas mentioned that you don't have to be totally concealed when it comes to deer. Um, but, you know, you do want to avoid wearing um, clothing like blue uh, is one of the main ones. But if, uh, you know, you don't have to go out and buy the expensive camouflage and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, think about how you're hunting. If you're going to be in a blind, you know, do I need camouflage? A lot of times if I hunt in a blind, I wear black. Uh, black hat, black shirt, stuff like that, because I want to blend into that blackness around. Uh, but when I say appropriate, make sure it's warm. Uh, you're going to want warm clothing as the uh, cold weather comes in um, and stuff. And make sure it's comfortable uh, and you don't mind getting dirty. Uh, you may get blood on it um, after harvesting a deer. So, uh, you know, keep, keep that in mind on your clothing. And then, of course, <clears throat> hunter safety, um, orange orange hat, orange vest, if you're doing any rifle or muzzleloading hunting. Um, even if you're, if you're, if your child's hunting, um, and they're wearing it, you know, if there's a rifle season going on or a muzzlo season, even working on my farm, I wear something orange all the time. Um, because, uh, the light, you know, there, there's always a chance that my neighbor not, may not know I'm across the fence and may not be able to see me. But if I have something orange on, then that's a better chance that they'll see me, um, over on my, my property. <clears throat> and then lastly, for safety, um, you know, you never know if you, when you get lost, but um, some things that uh, I would carry, you know, is a lighter or, or matches. Hey, Bobby, Get you're lost. kind of cutting out there. Hey, Bobby, can you hear me? Your connection got pretty bad right there. It didn't fix itself quickly like it did the first time. Um, yeah, you're kind of glitchy. How about now? That might be a little bit better. I'll just, if you could repeat what you, that last hmm. sentence. Can we log out and log back in? Um, I'll tell you if we need to do it. I'll cut you off one more time if I have to. But sometimes it's been resetting itself doing um, good. So. Okay. Well, binoculars is something that's nice to have. Uh, I was saying you don't want to use your scope to look for animals um, because you may be pointing a rifle at a Hey, uh, hey, Bobby. Let's log back in. Do, so let's let's um, re-log okay. back in. I'm going to talk to them for a second. Um, you know, a single single monocular works, but uh, something that's nice to have. Other thing is, is backpack. Okay. okay, he's so while he's going to log back in, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit um, about, so we have a chat box here. And like I said, we're going to open it up to questions at the end of this. And so if you guys want to go ahead, if you have any questions along the way, go ahead and type them in that chat box. And then I'll kind of field the questions at the end. So it'll give me some time to um, look over, find the, the great ones, the good ones, and then send them to the people that need to answer it. So just go ahead and do that if you haven't already. And it's the little icon that looks like a... Um, little text text bubble or something like that. And I don't know what it looks like on a phone if you guys are on a phone though. The great thing about Zoom calls or, or video chats is that we can all do this in our homes, but sometimes our homes are out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and that's, that causes little spotty uh, internet connections sometimes. So 
bear with us here. I might actually have Jacob take this one until Bobby can get logged back in and he might just need to call in. So I'm going to recommend that, but go ahead, Jacob, you can take off from here. Okay, guys, uh, my name's Jacob Harriet. I'm the Lincoln County Game Warden, and I have a little presentation for you here, and I'm going to try to get it pulled up. So just about everything I'm going to talk to you about tonight is actually on our website. It's uh, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife.com. So I just took a bunch of screenshots off of it. Can you all see that? I'm, I'm going to have to get yes, some audio getting, feedback. We're I, seeing I can... it. Okay, perfect. So the, uh, the first thing I'm going to show you, if, uh, if you don't learn anything from this, just try to take this away. Safety is the number one thing we can be conscious of when we're in the field. When we're out there hunting, that's awesome. It's a great bit of fun, but you have to be safe in your actions. And especially when you have a firearm, that bullet can go a long ways. So you just, uh, you, you want to be conscious of what you're doing out there. And so this is actually on our website. This is straight out of our hunter ed manual. And I just took a few screenshots, but, uh, in our firearm safety portion, there's an acronym we use called ACT. And you need to know this anytime you're hunting or anytime you have a firearm, you need to try to abide by these rules. And ACT, uh, A stands for assume that every gun is loaded. So if you get a firearm, uh, check and make sure it's unloaded. Even if someone tells you it's unloaded, go ahead and check. Uh, C is cont control the direction of the muzzle. Uh, point the gun in a safe direction. So you never want to point a gun at anything that you don't want to shoot. So be that, you know, dogs, friends, houses. I mean, just be safe when you have them. Uh, T is your trigger finger. So you want to keep your trigger finger uh, off the trigger until you're ready to fire, until you make that conscious decision to fire. And then the second T is target. You want to be certain of your target and what's beyond it. So even if you see the deer and it's sitting on a hilltop, if you shoot at that deer, that bullet can go a long ways over the hill. So you always want to make sure you have a good backstop, be it a big... Uh, hill or a ditch or something that you can shoot into where it'll stop that bullet and you'll be safe. Uh, going on from that, uh, a lot of times we have accidents that involve crossing obstacles, be it a fence, a creek, or anything like that. Uh, so when you're, cro when you're crossing a fence or anything, always unload your gun and don't ever just lean it on the fence. Actually set it flat on the ground. You can take your hat off and put it over the barrel. You don't want anything to get in that barrel and just do that as safely as possible. If you have two people, you can unload the gun, one person cross, he'll hand the guns to uh, the person that has already crossed, and then that person can cross. And that's just a safe way to cross obstacles. Uh, Hunter Orange, we've touched on it a little bit, but anytime there's a big game season, uh, rifle or muzzleloader, you have to wear at least 400 square inches of orange. So that uh, consists of an orange hat, a blaze orange hat, and a blaze orange vest and the more orange you can wear the better uh so i know a lot of people aren't 100 percent for it but the orange isn't there uh you know just to make you seen that it's there for people to see you and make it where you're not going to get shot because even if you're on a private parcel that you're supposed to be the only one hunting uh in my experience in law enforcement you're not the only one hunting that uh, people will sneak on and they can be shooting at your deer and uh not ever even see it. So you want to wear that orange and make yourself visible, and that's for your own safety. And then the last thing I just wanted to touch on, going out in youth season, I don't know. I know I prefer uh, hunting with youth from the ground. It's just a little easier, a little more controlled environment. But if you do uh, go up in a tree stand, make sure that they have a safety harness and you have a safety harness on. We have a ton of accidents that come from tree stands, and anytime you're getting off the ground, even if it's a few feet, uh, you need to be strapped in, so if you fall, something will catch you. And then along that lines, too, if you're getting in a tree stand, always make sure your straps are uh, safely secured so when you get in that tree stand, it'll support your weight. But that's just a little bit of safety, so if you don't take anything else away, take that away. Uh, now, this is also uh, public uh, on our website, and you can get it at Walmart, Bass Pro, Cabela's, anywhere like this, anywhere like that. But it is our Oklahoma hunting and fishing regs. And just about everything you need to know to be a responsible hunter or angler is in this book. So regulations, uh, places where you can hunt, everything is in here. So I just want to kind of help you all navigate this a little bit. So this is a, the cover. This is a recent edition. And then the next page is the content. So you can see it's broke up into fishing regulations and hunting regulations. 
So you can go through here, figure out what you want to hunt. So we're going to go look at big game regulations and deer. And so we're just going to scroll through here. And this isn't an order. I just took some screenshots, but you can navigate it through that. On top of that, and also a really good thing to know is your local game warden. So if you're out there hunting and you see something that doesn't look right or somebody drives by and shoots from the road or just anything that isn't right, you can get on this map right here, find the county you're in, and then the uh, corresponding game warden's number. So here we are. Uh, I'm in District 5 in Lincoln County. So I can come down here and, well, I didn't even get that page on there. So District 1, uh, you can pick your county and then come down here and the corresponding game warden for that county is going to be on there. Uh, on to your licensing and stuff. So everything's on here and it's all online as well. But if you have an issue with it, call one of the game wardens before you go out. That way you know you're legal. But for youth season, you, all you your youth need is just your resident uh, youth deer gun license. So anyone under uh, eight, 18 needs that and they have to have it for either sex of what they're harvested. So there's an antler and an antler less. And same for non-residents. Uh, that theirs is actually uh, not. Let's see. So right here, non-resident youth deer gun, either sex. So that covers either sex, covers both tags, and it's a hundred dollars for the non-residents. But this is just a good kind of a price list of what uh, exactly you need. Then we're going to go to your license exemptions. And so if you're under 16 years of age, you uh, don't have to have a hunting license. You're exempt from the hunting license. So all you need is your deer license for each deer you hunt. And then if you're in between 16 and under 18, you can get a youth license, which is also very cheap. And then on top of your youth hunting license, you all also need your deer license for each animal hunted. Uh, scrolling down here, so hunter education. Uh, I know a lot of young guys don't have it just because you have to be 10 to uh, take a hunter ed class and pass it. And I really recommend taking the in-person classes. They're a lot more interactive, and I feel like you learn a lot more from them. But if you do not have hunter ed, you don't have to worry because you can do an apprentice license. And basically what an apprentice license is, is if you don't have your hunter education, you can hunt with somebody as long as they're able to take uh, immediate control of that gun. And they have to be at least 18 years old and be a licensed hunter. But if you can hunt with them and as long as you're close, y'all can hunt together, that's no problem at all. And then once you take uh, your hunter ed class, you're actually able to hunt by yourself as long as uh, you have permission to do so from your folks. And all, like I said, all this is in the regulations book. So on to our big game regulations. So uh, we'll look right down here for youth, youth gun season. So most of y'all will be hunting with a rifle. So a legal rifle is any center fire rifle firing at least 55, gra 55 grain bullet with a soft nose or a hollow nose point. Uh, also shotguns or center fire with a single slug are also legal. And then shows a little bit about our hunter orange and the legality on that. We already talked about it. Have a vest and a head covering more if you can wear it. So after you get your deer, I know you're going to be really excited. Uh, but the one thing we have to remember to do is put on a field tag. So a field tag can be anything for deer, elk, antelope. You have to immediately attach a field tag. And I usually take a piece of cardboard and some rope and just tie it on there. And then you have to write your license number, uh, name, time, and date of harvest. And that needs to be done immediately after you shoot it. And then after you uh, get it field tagged, you have 24 hours to check that thing in online. So you get on our online uh, app or through our website, you could check it in. It's really easy. Uh, for deer season limits, uh, for youth, you come right down here to youth deer gun. It'll show your season dates, October 16th through the 18th, and you can harvest two. No more than one can be antlered. And that's really kind of the gist of uh, what you need to know regulation-wise. Like I said, you can look all the stuff up online or in the paper magazine. And if you do have a question on something, call the game warden. Get straightened out before you go. We're here to help you guys. Uh, so we just want you to have a good, safe hunt, especially youth hunters. I love youth hunters. Uh, I want them to have the best time in the world out in the woods and stay safe doing so. And one last thing I was going to touch on is our Go Outdoor Oklahoma app. So through this app, you can do just about anything. You get it on your smartphone, and uh, you download it to there. So this is a screenshot of it in an app store. 
and this open, I already had it, but you just hit download. It'll go right to your phone. If you've ever had a hunting license, you already have an account. And once you get on there, it'll pop up these four boxes. So now you don't have to go to Walmart and buy your license. You can purchase it right there online. When I check you in the field, you can go to my account and log your account in there. And parents, you can log your uh, kids' accounts in there as well. So you can show me their license off this. But you pull this up, and it shows all your license information. And I just have to look at it. It shows your sunrise and sunset. And then also you check your, uh, your big game in on this. So after you shoot a deer, you can immediately check it in over this app if you'd like to. And that's about all I had uh, on regs. If y'all have any questions on that, uh, I think we're going to answer them a little bit later. But uh, like I said, I I'm one of the game wardens, and I know er all the other game wardens are happy to help as well. So if you have questions, just give us a, uh, a holler, and we're just here to try to make your outdoor time a little more enjoyable. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Um, one clarification, um, just to make sure, youth have to be in company with an adult um, at all times during youth season, correct? Yes, so they, they have to be with an adult uh, 18 years or older. Okay, good deal. I think that is it. Um, okay, so Bobby, I think Bobby's back on now with uh, through his cell phone, so this should be a little bit better. Um, if Jacob would go ahead and mute himself, and then Bobby, I'll give you the rest of the floor now. <laughs> Sorry about that interruption earlier. And if you're talking, Bobby, you'll have to make sure you unmute yourself. Can you hear me now, Casey? Yes. All right, cool. So let's try this now. Sorry about the interruption, guys. This is, you know, got trial and error here. But uh, I was talking about some things that you don't necessarily have to have to hunt, but it's nice to have. Binoculars is one of them, a uh, backpack, uh, a GPS. Of course, most of our phones now have apps on it that we can download and use that as GPS. Uh, there's a several apps out there that um, some are free, some cost a little bit of money, but uh, you can search around and find a good app to give you GPS. Of course, Dallas talked about the, how good the deer can smell. So, you know, if you pick you up some scent um, attractant, then that can help too um, as well. Um, you know, when it gets cold, having some hand and foot warmers is always nice to have to break some of them out, keep your fingers and toes uh, warm. Uh, game calls, uh, deer are vocal, so uh, they do have calls, some grunt calls and, and some bleak calls that um, you can uh, pick up and, and try uh, and learn how to call them. And then um, the one thing I really like that I kind of got it on a nice to have, but I really think it should be on a must have, and that's a seat or a cushion. Um, comfortable sitting, because if you sit there for a while and you're uncomfortable, you're not going to want to stay uh, very long. Then after the hunt, you know, after you uh, harvest your deer, uh, some things that I like to carry is some gloves uh, to carry. Uh, they make they have some gloves that actually have sleeves that goes up to your shoulders. Uh, that's nice for when you're gutting a deer. Of course, you need some knives. Uh, you need sharp knives. Dull knives are, are, are not good. You want your knives as sharp as possible. Uh, a, a good deer drag or, or cart that you can put your deer on and, and haul it out of the woods or uh, help, drag, help you drag it through the woods is, is nice, too. Uh, a pelvic saw um, would be uh, good to uh, cut through the pelvic to remove the uh, the bladder and everything of the deer. And then lastly, um, I see a lot of people go hunting, but they forget to take a cooler. Um, and and it's important that as soon as you harvest your animal and you can get it clean, you know, get it in a cooler and get it on ice. Uh, you're you're going to be a lot. Your, your meat's going to taste a lot better. So um, that's some of the things you don't like. I said there's a ton of things you guys can go buy. Um, the, the, you know, and it may or may not help you, but you don't need all of the, the, the fancy, the fancy stuff to go hunting. Uh, you can start out basically like Bruce said on a shooting stick, you can take two sticks and screw them together and make a shooting stick if, uh, instead of buying a hundred dollar stick. But the hundred dollar stick is nice. Now I wanted to talk to, to you guys that if you're taking your child out, especially this is your first time your child goes out. Uh, I'd like to go over some things to make you think about this. Uh, I was blessed. Um, I had triplet boys. So when I took my kids hunting, I didn't have just one kid with me. I had uh, three uh, at all times. So some things I learned over the time is, you know, don't have unrealistic expectations. Um, kids, especially younger kids, they're going to make noise. 
they're not going to sit still, uh, and that's fine. Uh, you know, especially during youth season, it's their hunt. They're going to want to explore, talk, ask questions. You know, and I always encourage my kids to do that. Um, I also keep my hunts short and active. You know, I don't go out there and sit all day with my uh, eight-year-old. Uh, they get bored pretty quick, and they're going to want to go. So a lot of times when the young, I have younger kids, eight, nine, ten years old, I may limit my hunt to 45 minutes an hour um, and make it a walking, moving type hunt if I can. You know, slipping through the woods, stop looking and, you know, talk about what you hear, you know, different birds, different stuff, you know, look for your scrapes, look for your, your rubs uh, of your tree and, and, and experience all that stuff um, on that. The next thing is, is not emphasizing safety. You know, uh, safety is, as Jacob talked about that, safety should be your number one priority with honey uh, and especially hunting with kids. Accidents can hump, happen anywhere, but, you know, hunting with someone who's inexperienced will increase your likelihood of an accident. So don't assume your child knows the ins and outs of hunting safety. Um, take the time not only to teach them about their safety, but, you know, you've got eyes watching you. They're going to mimic what you do or don't do. So make sure that you're setting a good example uh, for your child and you're teaching them the, the right way because you, you don't want your child to grow up and get involved in a hunting accident um, any, at any time. Uh, next is putting other goals uh, ahead of fun. You know, um, if your kids don't have fun the first couple of times, they really don't want to go back. So, you know, make it fun. Make this hunt about them, not about you, uh, but make it about them. You know, you can have a game with them, you know, identifying the birds, the trees, you know, uh, let them collect leaves, rocks, and other items. Uh, encourage them to learn about the wildlife in, in the woods. Um, let them bring along books, crayons, toys, or even some electronics, you know. I carry an extra battery for my iPhone, so when my battery on my phone goes low, I can plug it in and, and keep them entertained and, and keep them out in the woods just a little bit longer. The next thing is being inadequately prepared, you know. Uh, taking kids with inadequate gear, uh, food, or drinks will ruin a hunt pretty fast. Um, you know, we we get kids, and, and it's hard to find shoes for them. You want to buy them some rubber boots, but they're three sizes too big. Well, you wouldn't want to walk around in boots that are three sizes too big. Uh, they don't either. So, you know, try to find clothing that you can fit them. Again, you don't have to go out and buy the expensive stuff. A lot of people with kids, especially me with three, I'd go to Goodwill and shop around and look for used clothing because I know my kids, this, they're only going to wear it one season and they're only going to wear it a couple of times. So uh, I wouldn't go uh, spend a lot of money. The next is uh, don't expect your kids to shoot before they're ready. You know, uh, there's no set minimum age for a child to shoot their first animal, but it's up to you to make a wise call when that child is ready. So letting your, your child shoot a gun or kill an animal before they're quite mentally or physically equipped can quell their uh, passion for hunting, you know, uh, let the child tell you when uh, when they want to shoot an animal, and, and don't push them. You know, don't don't put a bunch of pressure on them. If they don't want to shoot, uh, that's fine. Just let them let them enjoy the hunt. Let them watch the animals and stuff like that. It's going to pay off later in uh, later in the year um, on that. You know, uh, some of us uh, Dallas talked about the deer moving when it's cold. You know, I love hunting in cold weather, so. Uh, because I like to see more, I actually see more deer, but uh, kids don't. So, uh, you know, think about that, you know. I've got heaters in some of my blinds that we, we go out there and crank the heater up and set in the blind and, and stay a little bit toasty in that. Um, the next is unintentionally setting up for failure. You know, if your child does not want to shoot an animal, don't uh, make sure your child, is, if your child does want to shoot an uh, animal, like Bruce says, make sure they practice with that that firearm that they're using, that they're comfortable with it, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, again, you know, I would use a smaller caliber. Um, one of the quickest ways to to teach a child a bad habit is to let them shoot a gun that's too big for them, like say uh, a 300 Win Mag or something like that. That's going to have a lot of recoil. Uh, that um, teaches them to have a um, uh, they won't be steady as they shoot. Um, and then, you know, get your kids out. Do everything for your kids. Let your kids actually just for planning the hunt, uh, as well as the day activities. You know, let them work. Talk to them about where you guys are going to go hunting and let them kind of pick out places they want to go. Uh, that Let them pack their own uh, backpack, prepare their snacks, um, stuff like that. 
if you do shoot it, if they, if they are successful shooting a deer and uh, you're having to follow uh, blood, let them help help find the blood. Uh, a lot of times, especially as older I get, uh, they've got a lot better eyes than I do, and they'll find blood that, that I won't see. And then one of the things I see parents do or, or grown-ups do, we do it unintentionally. We don't realize the damage we're doing, but um, if a child feels a, a sense of sadness after the kill, sometimes they may cry. Well, the last thing we want to do is shame that kid for that, you know. Um, that's not the, the best approach for your child on that. So um, some some adults will try to ignore it uh, and dismiss, or they'll dismiss their child's feeling. They may even try to shame them. Yeah. But instead of ignoring or shaming, shaming the child, you know, validate their feelings. Use this opportunity to talk to your child about how hunting contributes to conservation. It provides meat for your family. And it's an opportunity to enjoy the great outdoors. And then lastly, uh, one thing that I see that can um, make a child not want to go hunting is when you push too hard for them to go hunting. You know, youth season's coming up. It's a three-day weekend. Uh, there's only one time a year that it comes up. And, you know, um, I've got a niece right now that I would love to get into hunting in that, but uh, she's just I, I offer, I offer to take her, but she um, has yet taken me up on it, and I don't push her. So um, one day she'll come to me and she'll want to go hunting, and I'll take her hunting and expose her to that. So uh, I hope you guys have fun with your kids. Uh, some of my best hunting memories I've ever had uh, involve my kids. It's not me harvesting an animal, but my kids harvesting an animal, and and even being out in the woods and enjoying family time with them. It's, it's something special for me. So I, I wish you guys great great luck and great success um this coming up weekend so casey i think that's it that i got that's all i got okay thank you bobby that was very thorough we really appreciate that um okay before i open it up to questions i kind of just wanted to show you guys some how to get to our public hunting areas on our website i'm gonna go share my window right now sorry there's a little bit of a lag time here on this Okay, so basically, you go to our wildlifedepartment.com, very, very straightforward. You go to hunting tab, and you go to where to hunt, like that. And this has all the areas, northeast, northwest, and you can click them and break them down that way. Um, we also have our OLAP uh, lands, but none of these are rifles. So if you want to branch out to archery, OLAP would be a great option for you. Um, if you guys don't know about OLAP, it's uh, where we lease private land from public or we lease private land for public hunting and fishing opportunities in Oklahoma. And it's only been around for three or four years. So it's a great opportunity to basically t uh, hunt land that's probably not been hunted before or hasn't been hunted very hard before. So back to uh, all of our WMAs, you can click on, for example, Northeast, and you can look at all of our areas up there. So just depending on your location. And another thing I think that you guys might be interested in is since we're all sighting our rifles right now, one week before youth season, uh, we have shooting ranges. And here's a list of our shooting ranges as well. So you guys can look on there. And I always suggest uh, consulting your local, either your game warden or your biologist, but, um, because some areas have area-specific regulations. So just make sure you're, you check that and you're legal. And those, I'm going to unshare my screen now, um, those that regulations that Jacob was talking about and going through, um, that's like your outdoor Bible. You guys should always have that and you can refer to it. It'll probably have anything that you have a question about in there. And if it doesn't, it'll have the number of someone that does have the answer to your question. So um, before I open it up, I think, think I'm going to find a few questions here. And Jacob and uh, Bobby, you guys are not muted right now. You got to get a little bit of feedback here. But uh, okay, so I'm going to read this first one. Okay, we already answered uh, Travis's question, but Rhett has a question. It says, what are some of the best recommended options for concealment in the field while hunting if you do not have blinds or tree stands? So whoever wants to hand, uh, answer that question, just take it away. I can hop in and just explain a little bit of what I do. Um, so where I'm at, uh, I do a lot of hunting in Western Oklahoma and cedar trees are readily available. Um, so one of those things that, that Bobby had mentioned about some of the nicer things to have would be just a little pocket saw. Um, and you can saw a couple of those cedar trees down and kind of build yourself a, a little blind out of that. 
um, or just utilizing some taller brush that's around whatever areas you're you're wanting to hunt, be that uh, Johnson grass or some of the shinnery oak or scrub oak that happens to be in western Oklahoma. Okay, great. Um, can anybody else add to that or anything different that you guys do? Uh, right along those lines where I hunt, I'll just uh, get in a heavily wooded area, use all the brush and stuff that's already fallen down, fallen limbs, and just kind of make a makeshift blind and I'll kick out all the leaves so I can move real quietly. But other than that, just make you a little nest to hunt in and you're good to go. Okay. Um, so Callie asked, uh, do I have to wear both blaze orange hat and vest, or can I just wear one or the other? And then she says, wear both got it. However, there's a certain amount of square inches that you are required to have. So, so Jacob, I'm sure you can cover that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's 400 square inches, which is basically, uh, an orange vest and an orange hat. And it needs to be blaze orange, not like OSU orange. It needs to be a really, really bright orange. You don't, if it's faded or anything, uh, just throw it away and, or wear it some other time. But if you're hunting, wear it, make sure it's blaze orange. And one other thing that I, I would want to add on to that um, is if you're hunting in a blind, um, make sure that you bring an extra either orange hat or orange vest to put, you know, kind of on the top of that blind so other hunters can see you. Um, the second that you walk into the door of that pop-up blind or that tower blind, people can't see that you're in that. So just something to consider, um, you know, safety is by far the number one priority when it comes to hunting. So um, just a, a nice little tip there. Uh, another thought on that too, once you get to the area that you are hunting, don't take that stuff off. I see that a lot. People will walk into their tree stands, wear their hunter orange, get in the stand, they'll take it off and put it in their backpack. You need to wear that the whole time from when you get out of your truck till you get back in it. You need to have that orange on. Okay. Oh, Bobby. I was just going to say all the cool cats wear hunters orange, so be a cool cat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so another question we have from Tony is if he does get lucky enough to get a deer or a buck, once I get it to the processor, but um, but I want to keep the skull tag, or does this tag stay with the body or do I need to legally transport its head to my home? Or how would someone go about that? Sorry, did that make sense? I butchered that. Yeah, so the best thing to do on that is once you check that deer in, you get a confirmation number. And it's real easy just to write that confirmation number and uh, attach it. And your processor will have that uh, the whole time he's going through it. And then you can also just make another one and attach it to that head and you're good to go. Okay, um, Callie also would like to know if it's possible to stock hunt deer or is blind hunting the way to go? Nothing is impossible when you're in the woods. <laughs> but it's definitely, depending on where you're at, it's a little more difficult. And Dallas, if you want to chime in, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, spot and stalk hunting is definitely possible. Um, it is a lot, you know, it kind of depends on, on where you're at. Um, that tends to be a, a lot more uh, utilized method uh, on the west side of the state where visibility is a lot higher. Um, but when it comes to youth hunting, um, there are a lot of dangerous, you know, aspects that come along with that. That's far longer that, that, that youth hunter has to walk with a firearm. Um, you know, it's not something that you're just going to walk up on a deer. There's usually a lot of, of hiking and, uh, and walking involved with that. But however, it, it's not out of the, out of the spectrum of, of possibilities. And Callie, um, one thing that I've noticed, like one of the better ways or one, better opportunities to spot and stalk deer is when it had just rained because a lot of times those leaves don't crackle. And so if you're, if you're just an adult early onset hunter and you don't have to take, if you're not taking a child out, um, I would consider doing it when it had just rained because the ground is a lot quieter and you know, other than that, it's really hard to be quiet when you're crunching on leaves walking across the the, the the land so and it looks like colin berg had added a couple of links here um it says here's a great link to a uh, guide to taking youth and then he also said that not every wma is open to youth season but uh, our deer page has it broken down and there's a link to that as well 
Is there any more questions? Okay, Callie said she learned a lot. Awesome, that's good to know. Okay, so it looks like we wrapped up. We hit around eight o'clock. That was about a one hour session. That's great. After some technical difficulties, I say we did all right. Um, I do want to mention that I'm going to, this is being recorded and I'm going to, this will be posted on our webpage and I'm going to send everybody a follow-up email for the next month's uh, Learn to Hunt class and then any sort of information on uh, wild game recipes or tips and tricks as well. Um, that'll kind of get, get you on your way. So yeah, I think that's it. We're going to wrap it up and then everybody have a good and successful and fun hey, season. Yes, sir. I think one more person asked a question oh, right sorry. there at the very end. They said, oh, if yes. you check your gear in on the phone right after you recover, do you still need the field tag? So the answer to that is yes. Um, that field tag will need to stay on that carcass until it's reached its final destination. So be that the uh, your house or the taxidermist or the processor, you know, wherever that deer goes, it needs to have a field tag attached to the carcass. Yeah. And, and if, if you do uh, do that and you want to check it in automatically, just make sure you put your confirmation number on that field tag. Okay. Looks like we got everybody's questions answered. So, all right, well, we're going to get off here and I sure appreciate you guys taking the time. I hope it was helpful and just be looking forward to our email coming out next or the next class. I, I think it's going to be over quail hunting. So anyways, stay tuned and thank you guys. Good luck. Hunters in the know, take a doe. Yes. Thank you all for taking the youth hunting. We appreciate it. Absolutely.